So, welcome, firstly, Jörn Hude. Yeah, well, um, oh, sorry, that was really loud. Yeah, <laughs> it's not, I, I try to read a lot of popular science books uh, every year, and it's not often that I read a popular science book completely and like it. <laughs> Mostly I end about halfway. Uh, but this was a book that was sent to me by the publisher, and I didn't know anything about it, but I started to read. And I read, and I read, and I read. And I, I, I think it's one of these really few popular science books that give you a different perspective on life. Yes, it's really big to say that, but, but for those of you that's not read it yet, I will not disclose too much because <laughs> Harari will do that in his talk anyway. But, uh, but really, the, the thoughts are so big, and the way he puts human history together in a package in one book. I've never read anything like it. So I really hope that you will appreciate the talk now and also read the book afterwards because it's, uh, yeah, it made a lasting impression on my way of thinking, really. And hopefully that will also be part of the, of the discussion after uh, Harari's talk. So with no further ado, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and talk a lot. I'm, I'm a big fan. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to your talk, uh, <laughs> Johal. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> so thanks for the introduction and the invitation and for everybody who came to hear this talk about ourselves about uh, our species, about humankind, how we conquer the planet. Uh, if we go back around 70,000 years, then we find that our ancestors, Homo sapiens, that lived in East Africa back then, were insignificant animals. The most important thing you need to know about our ancestors is that they were unimportant animals. Their impact on the world, on the ecological system, was not much greater than that of chimpanzees, or fireflies, or jellyfish, or woodpeckers, or many other uh, uh, species of, of, of animals. If you look at the world today, you find that we dominate this planet. The future of life on Earth, to a large extent, depends on us. And the question I would like to address is how exactly we reached from there to here, from being insignificant apes minding their own business in a corner of Africa, not bothering anybody else too much, to being the masters of this planet and of the future of life. And when we raise this question of the secret of success of our species, people tend, people generally try to find the answer on the individual level, as if there is something special about the individual human being, about me, say, that makes me such a superior creature in comparison to a chimpanzee or to a dog or to a pig. But the truth is that on the individual level, I am embarrassingly similar to, chimp to a chimpanzee. And if you place me and a chimpanzee together on some lonely island to see who survives better, I would definitely place my bets on the chimpanzee, not on myself. And I don't think it is something wrong with me personally. I guess if they took almost any one of you and placed you alone on some lonely island with a chimpanzee, the chimpanzee would probably do better. So it's not on the individual level that we need to look for the secret of success of our species. It's rather on the collective level. Humans, to, to, to make a long story short, we humans control the planet because we are the only animal, as far as we know, ever in the history of the planet that managed to cooperate flexibly in large numbers. Now, there are other animals, especially the social insects, like the ants and the bees and the termites, that know how to cooperate in very large numbers, but they don't have flexibility. Their system of cooperation is determined by their genetic code to such a degree 
that if, for example, a beehive faces a new danger or a new opportunity, there is no way that the bees are going to reinvent their social system overnight. There is no way that the bees can, for example, execute the queen bee and establish a communist dictatorship of worker bees. They, they can't do it. Uh, other social animals, like the social mammals, like chimpanzees and baboons and dolphins and uh, elephants, they are much more flexible in the way that they cooperate than the social insects, but they can cooperate only in relatively small numbers because cooperation, for example, among our chimpanzee cousins is based on intimate, personal acquaintance one with the other. If I'm a chimpanzee and you're a chimpanzee and I want to cooperate with you, I need to get to know you personally. What kind of chimpanzee are you? You're a nice chimpanzee. Are you an evil chimpanzee? Can I trust you? If I don't know you personally, I can't cooperate with you. And because it's impossible to get to know hundreds of thousands of individuals, then chimpanzees cannot cooperate in numbers larger than, say, about 100 or 200. Humans are the only animals that can combine the two abilities. We cooperate in very large numbers, much more so than the bees or the ants, yet we retain the flexibility of, uh, of chimpanzees and, and wolves, and of course we are even much more flexible uh, than they are. We can create social systems of cooperation that unite millions and today even billions of individuals and change them almost overnight. And this makes all the difference. One versus one, or even 10 versus 10, we are not superior to chimpanzees. But if you pit a thousand humans against a thousand chimpanzees, the humans will easily win for the simple reason that a thousand chimpanzees cannot cooperate at all. And if you now try to cram a hundred thousand chimpanzees into a big sports stadium or into, uh, let's say, Wall Street or the Vatican, you will get complete chaos. If you try to cram a hundred thousand humans into Wall Street or the Vatican or Wembley Stadium, you get very sophisticated networks of cooperation in religion or sports or economics. Uh, even this lecture that I'm giving here can serve as a good example of this unique human ability. Um, there are about, I don't know, 150, 200 people now in, 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 this, uh, in this hall. I don't know the vast majority of you. I just came to Oslo for the first time three days ago from flying from Tel Aviv. I don't know the pilot and the crew member of the plane of Austrian Airlines that brought me over here from Tel Aviv. I don't know the people who built this hall and who invented this computer and this screen that enables me, that helps me to convey my ideas to you. I don't know all the people who wrote all the books and articles that I've read uh, in preparation for, for this talk. Even though all of these people are strangers, we don't know each other, nevertheless, we can cooperate effectively uh, in order to create this global exchange of ideas. This is something that chimpanzees, again, cannot do. Chimpanzees certainly convey information to one another, but you never see a chimpanzee leaving his band and going to the territory of a distant chimpanzee band to give them a talk about bananas or about elephants or about humans or, or something else that might interest chimpanzees. It never happens. Of course, cooperation is not always nice. We usually associate cooperation like with Sesame Street, where we teach children to cooperate and be nice to each other, but should be emphasized that cooperation is also responsible for all the terrible things that humans have been doing throughout history, whether it's armies or slaughterhouses or prisons or concentration camps. All of these are also examples of unique ways of mass cooperation that only humans have. Chimpanzees don't have slaughterhouses and prisons and concentration camps. It's uniquely, uh, uniquely human uh, ways of cooperating. Um, and suppose that I perhaps managed to convince you that yes, 
uh, our secret of success is this ability to cooperate in, in large numbers in, in a flexible way, that all the big achievements of humankind, whether it's building the pyramids or reaching the moon or splitting the atom, these are all the result not of individual genius, they are the result of mass cooperation. The next question which almost always pops up in the mind of an inquisitive uh, audience is what enables humans, alone of all the animals, to do it, to cooperate flexibly in large numbers. And the answer, at least the answer that I can give you, is the human imagination. And in particular, the ability to invent fictional stories and spread them around. If you examine any large-scale human cooperation, you will always find some fictional story at its basis. Uh, and this is, a unique, again, a uniquely human ability. You can never convince a chimpanzee to give you a banana by promising him that if you give me this banana, after you die, you'll go to chimpanzee heaven, and there you will receive lots and lots of bananas for your good deeds here on earth, so now give me this banana. No chimpanzee will ever believe such a story. Only humans can believe such stories, which is why we control the world and not the chimpanzees. As long as millions of people all believe in the same story, they all follow the same laws, the same norms, they all believe in the same values, and this is what enables even complete strangers to cooperate effectively. Now, people usually find it perhaps easy to accept with regard to religion, especially when it's not their religion. And somebody else's religion, yes, this is based on fiction, mine, mine not, mine is the truth. But even if we leave religion aside, what I want to emphasize is that this mechanism of using fiction as the basis for cooperation is not a unique phenomenon to the religious field, it also forms the basis for human cooperation in all other fields, in politics, in the legal sphere, in the economic sphere. For example, in the uh, legal and political sphere, perhaps the most important idea of our time is human rights. But human rights are a fiction, just like God and heaven. They are not a biological reality. Uh, if you take a human and cut him open and look inside, you find the blood and the kidneys and hormones and neurons. You don't find any rights. And even if you look very closely inside the DNA and you read what's written in the DNA, you don't find anywhere the Declaration of Human Rights written in, uh, in genetic code. The only place you find rights is in the stories that people have invented, not very, not very f uh, in back in the distant past, but over the last few centuries, and spread around, and today billions of people believe in this story that humans have a right to life and to liberty and to freedom of expression and so forth, and this forms the basis for much of the legal and political cooperation networks in the world. Now, I don't want to imply that this is bad, Fiction isn't bad. I mean, Harry Potter isn't bad. Fiction can be very good and very, also it's a very powerful tool, but it's still, it's not reality. It's something that we construct in our imagination. And again, as long as everybody shares the same imagination, it works. The same thing happens in the economic sphere. Uh, perhaps the greatest story ever told is the story of money. Not everybody believes in human rights, not everybody believes in God, not everybody believes in heaven and hell, but everybody believes in money. And even more amazingly, everybody believes in the same money, like the dollar bill. Now, the dollar bill, when you look at it, like human rights, it has no object, it's not, it's not an objective reality. It has, the, this piece of paper has no objective value whatsoever. You cannot eat it, you cannot drink it, you cannot wear it, you can't do anything with it. But then come along the master storytellers of our era, not the people who won Nobel Prize in literature. They are not really good storytellers. The best storytellers in the world, they should really receive the Nobel Prize for literature. They are the chairman of the Federal Reserve. They are the big bankers, the finance ministers. They tell the best stories in the world. They come to us and they say, you see this green piece of paper? 
we are telling you that it is worth 10 bananas. And if I believe it and you believe it and everybody believes it, it actually works. I can take this worthless green piece of paper, go to the supermarket, give it to a complete stranger whom I've never met before, and he will give me real bananas in exchange, which I can actually eat. This is something that no other animal can do. Chimpanzees, they can trade, they can barter. I'll give you a coconut and you'll give me a banana that can work among chimpanzees. But uh, you'll give me a piece of paper and you expect to get bananas in return. This will not work with chimpanzees. You can try it. You can also try if you have a dog or a cat. Try to give them money so they will give up your shoe or something. It won't happen. Only humans can believe such stories, which is why we have such sophisticated financial and trade relations, whereas all other animals uh, do not. Now, what should be emphasized is that it's not easy to construct and to uh, spread these stories. The difficulty is not in telling the story. The real difficulty is, of course, in convincing everybody to believe in the same story. If each person has a different story in, in the mind, it won't work. You need to implant the same stories in the minds of everybody. Otherwise, you can't form a system of cooperation. And much of history revolves around the question how do you make millions of people believe in the same fictions? How do you make millions of people believe in the dollar bill and not in some other kind of currency, like the Bitcoin? How do you make millions of people believe in one God and not in a different God? This is a very difficult thing. Again, much of history revolves around this question. And of course, it doesn't always succeed. My, many of the big conflicts of, in history are exactly about that. People sometimes think that humans fight for the same reason that other animals like chimpanzees fight. Chimpanzees fight over territory. Chimpanzees fight over food. And people think these are the same, this is for the similar reason that also humans fight. And there are maybe a few rare occasions when humans fight for territory or food, but this is very, very rare. The vast majority of wars and revolutions and conflicts in history were not about territory, they were not about food, they were about fictional stories in the mind of people. Uh, I come from Israel, so I know something about conflicts at first hand. And if you think that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is about territory or food, you're mistaken. There is no objective shortage of land between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. There is enough territory to build houses and schools and hospitals for everybody. There is no objective shortage of food. There is enough pita bread and falafel and hummus to feed everybody until they puke. I mean, there is no shortage of uh, objective uh, shortage of food. The real problem is that you have two groups with two very, very different stories in their mind, and they cannot agree on a single story that both can accept and identify with. To take a counterexample from European history, a hundred years ago, Europeans were killing each other by the million in the First World War. And after it ended, they again killed each other by the million even more in the Second World War. In the second half of the 20th century, in the early 21st century, Europe became one of the most peaceful places ever in the history of humankind. What made the difference? Not the discovery of more land. It's not that suddenly new land emerged from the North Sea and they could divide it. Hey, you Germans take a bit and you French take a bit and now you'll be happy. No, there was no more new land. What happened is that Europeans managed to come up with a new story and a new identity which most Europeans were able to accept and be relatively happy with. So this was the key to the very big change in, uh, in the political history of Europe over the last century. Uh, we can say then, as kind of a, a summary sum, what we've covered so far, that humans are really unique animals and they dominate the planet because we live in a dual reality. All other animals live in an objective reality. 
the reality of chimpanzees consists of objective entities like rivers and trees and mountains and elephants and lions. These make up the world of a chimpanzee. We humans, we also, of course, live in an objective reality in our world too. There are rivers and trees and lions and elephants. But over the last tens of thousands of years, we have constructed on top of this objective reality a second layer of fictional reality a reality consisting of fictional entities like nations, like churches, like gods, like business corporations. And over time, the amazing thing is that these fictional entities became more and more powerful so that today they are the most powerful forces in the world. Today, the very survival of elephants and lions and chimpanzees and rivers and forests depends on the decisions and wishes of fictional entities like banks, like nations, like the European Union, like the United States. All these things exist only in our, in, in our mind, in our imagination, in the stories that we tell. And nevertheless, they now determine the fate of more and more of the ecosystem. Now we see then that the human domination of the world is not really a matter of individual genius and it's also not strictly a matter of technology. Yes, of course, humans dominate the world because they have all this amazing technology of trains and airplanes and computers and uh, nuclear weapons and, and so forth. But technology by itself is never enough you always need to combine technology with cooperation. You cannot invent and produce and use sophisticated technology unless you somehow manage to, uh, to build systems of cooperation that unite thousands or millions or billions of human beings. And in order to establish such cooperation, you need a good story. You need an ideological story or a religious story that people uh, would accept, would believe. In order to build, say, the Great Wall of China, of course you needed some technology, maybe of metal tools and uh, all kinds of things like that, but this by itself would never have been enough if the Chinese were not able to uh, use fictional stories in order to unite millions of people into a single empire. Now, as we look at the development of history over the last 70,000 years, what we see is a complex relationship between technology on the one hand and religions, ideologies, and other kinds of stories uh, uh, on the other hand. Technology, of course, is often the basis for the new powers that humankind have acquired. But every step forward, every new technological revolution also upsets the systems, the old systems of cooperation. And unless people can find good stories to replace the obsolete old stories, the technology by itself only results in chaos, not in a, an in a real increase in the power of humankind. Because you must find a way under the new technological conditions of still making millions of people uh, to cooperate. A good example is the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. In the 19th century, uh, humankind gained mastery over new technologies, new powers, like the steam engine, like electricity, like radio, like the internal combustion engine. But the immediate result of all these inventions was to create a lot of social and political chaos, a transition from traditional societies to modern industrial societies was extremely hard and difficult. New classes of people emerged, especially the urban proletariat, which people didn't know what to do with. And much of the political history of the 19th and 20th century revolved around the new problems of industrial society, which could not be solved, could not be answered using the traditional uh, ideologies, religions, and stories of humankind. Of course, the first, one of the first reactions always 
to um, uh, such technological upheaval and such social upheaval is to try to go back to the old stories and to find some security. When there is, uh, when there is change, most people, especially beyond a certain age, they don't like change. They're used to the world as it is. They don't like change. When there is a big change which destroys old institutions, old ways of life, and creates completely new religions, people first of all try to hold on to something stable, to find security. And therefore you often find that such revolutions are accompanied by a wave of fundamentalism. Fundamentalism means looking for a fundament, looking for a basis, and trying to go back to something that seems eternal, secure, that can protect us against all these changes. This happened in the 19th century during the Industrial Revolution. One of the first reactions to the Industrial Revolution was a wave of religious fundamentalism all over the world. I'll give just a few examples, there are many more. In Europe, for example, you had a wave of Catholic fundamentalism in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, the Pope, Pius IX, uh, declared a new dogma of the Catholic Church which said that not only all the answers to all the problems of humanity, including the new problems of, indu of industrial society, all the answers are, of course, in the Bible, but in addition to that, the Pope came up with a new dogma of papal infallibility, that the Pope is never wrong. Ask anything you want, and you'll get the answer from the Pope. This is not a medieval dogma. Many people think that this dogma goes back to the Middle Ages, or even to, to ancient, to classical times. No, it's a 19th century dogma. Similarly, in the Middle East, you also have a wave of Muslim fundamentalism. For example, in Sudan, you have the movement of the Mahdi, a, a person who declares himself to be the Mahdi, the Messiah. Millions of people follow him. Uh, they defeat the uh, Egyptian and English armies that are sent to try and suppress this rebellion. They behead the commander of the army, General Charles Gordon, in a gesture that shocks Victorian Britain in much the same way that the beheading now in the Middle East shock European audiences uh, uh, today. They establish a Muslim theocracy in the Sudan, governed by Sharia law. And they say, yes, all the problem of modern society, of industrialism, of European imperialism, all the answers will come from the Quran and from the Sharia law. Similarly, in India, we have a, a Hindu revival movement which says that all the answers are in the Vedas, in the Hindu scriptures. It is led by, by this man, Dayananda Saraswati. Uh, in China, the biggest war of the 19th century, many people think that the biggest war of the 19th century was the Napoleonic War or perhaps the American Civil War, but actually the biggest war of the 19th century and by a very wide margin is the Taiping Rebellion in China, when this person, Hong Xiu Kuan, a um, failed local scholar who couldn't even pass the examinations of the Chinese bureaucracy, after he fails the exams, he has a religious vision. God reveals himself to Hong and tells Hong that you, Hong, you are the younger brother of Jesus Christ, sent to earth by me, God, in order to establish the kingdom of heavenly peace. And Hong goes to the Chinese population in, in southern China with this message, and millions of people, uh, which are extremely concerned and anxious because of the destabilizing of the Chinese economy and society with the coming of European imperialism and with the coming of industrialization, they follow Hong because they hope that he, ha he has the answers. Uh, he doesn't establish a kingdom of heavenly peace. He leads them into the deadliest war of the 19th century. The Taiping Rebellion lasts about 14 years. According to the most modest estimates, at least 20, people die, 20 million people died in the Taiping Rebellion. And in the end, it was suppressed by the Chinese government backed by the modern industrial powers of Europe. Now, I guess most of you have not heard about the Taiping Rebellion or about uh, uh, Dayananda Saraswati or about the Mahdi because they all failed. They didn't 
they couldn't solve the new riddles, the new problems or, that were created by the Industrial Revolution. They looked for the answers in the wrong place. They looked for the answers in the Veda or in the Bible, in the Quran, but the people who wrote the Vedas and the Bible and the Quran didn't know anything about trains, about electricity, about modern industrial society and its unique problems and opportunities. So no wonder that no, no answers emerged from, from, these, from these places. In contrast, I guess most of you have heard about Marx and Engels and Lenin, even though in the early 19th century there were hardly any socialists at all. And even in 1850, in the middle of the 19th century, socialism was still a small fringe movement. Within a few decades, it became the most important and most influential uh, ideological movement, or you can say even religious movement, of the 19th century. Why were they so successful? Because they didn't look for answers in ancient texts. Marx and Engels and afterwards Lenin and Trotsky and all these fellows, they tried to find new answers by studying the new technologies, by studying the new realities of industrial society. They studied how a rail railroad network impacts the economy. What are the conditions in modern factories? And based on that, they created new ideologies, new stories. Lenin was once asked, they asked him, please explain to us, Vladimir, what is communism? In one sentence, don't, we don't want to read the Capital, it's too long, too complicated. In one sentence, what is communism? And Lenin answers, communism is power to workers' councils plus electrification of the whole country. There is no communism without electricity, without railroads, without radio. You could not establish a communist regime in 16th century Russia. You need modern industrial technology to have a communist regime. And communism, in, in, in a way, was the first techno-religion. A techno-religion is a story that promises people all the traditional prizes that also Judaism and Christianity and Hinduism promise. It promises peace and prosperity and paradise. But here on earth, with the help of technology, not after you die in some heavenly uh, paradise with the help of supernatural being. Communism was the first techno-religion, again, making the old religious promises, but on the basis of modern technology. And even the people who did not follow Marx, it changed the way that they view the world. It changed the basic discourse I until today of how we debate and how even we fight in the world. Until Marx and the Industrial Revolution, the big ideological conflicts in human history were often about metaphysical questions concerning the soul and God and the afterlife, uh, Christians and Muslims or Protestants and Catholics. They were arguing what will happen to the soul after we die? How do you reach heaven? How do you prevent yourself from ending in hell? These were the big divides between, say, the Catholics and the Protestants. Ever since Marx and the, com and the communists and the Marxists, the big divides, the big ideological divides of humankind are no longer about the soul or about the afterlife or about God. They are about technology, about the economy, about production methods. In the 1960s and 1970s, say during the Cuban Missile Crisis, humankind almost destroyed itself and much of the ecological system in an argument about production methods, not in an argument about the soul and God and the afterlife. Now, all this is very relevant to what's happening today in the world because we are on the verge or in the beginning of a new industrial revolution. If in the 19th century, humankind gained mastery over the power of steam and oil and electricity, then in the 21st century, we are gaining mastery over the new powers released by biotechnology and computer science. And 
this revolution will probably be far more influential, far more radical than anything that we saw in the 19th and 20th century. Back then, in the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, the new powers of steam and electricity and so forth, we, used, we humans used them in order to produce food and textiles and vehicles and weapons. Now in the 21st century, the main products of the new revolution will not be textiles and vehicles and food. They will be bodies and brains and minds. These are the main products of the 21st century human economy. We are learning how to manufacture, how to design and to produce bodies and brains and minds of, of ourselves and of other organisms and even of non-organic entities. After four billion years, during which life was confined to the relatively small realm of organic compounds, now life is about to break out into the vastly larger empire of inorganic stuff. And after four billion years in which all creatures, whether dinosaurs or amoebas, were made solely of organic compounds, in the next few decades, we are likely to see the emergence of non-organic life. And the greatest revolution, not only in history, but also in biology. And all of this, will, of course, create huge disturbances in human social systems, in human political systems, in the story that we tell ourselves in order to manage uh, billions of people on a single planet. Uh, it will present us with enormous new opportunities as well as with unprecedented dangers and threats. On the one hand, we'll have the possibility of upgrading humans into superhumans. Uh, if we, we are giving up on, on gods, but we will turn ourselves into new kinds of gods, we'll maybe acquire divine abilities through ourselves. At the same time, the same technology threatens to create new unprecedented gaps between different human classes or castes. Previously in history, all uh, class division was um, legal, economic, and political, but it was never biological. There was never any real deep difference on a biological level between the kings and the peasants, between the upper caste and the lower caste. Uh, in the future, however, in the not too distant future, we may for the first time see humankind splitting into different biological castes with real differences in physical and cognitive abilities between the rich and the poor, or between the elite and the masses of the population. At the same time, we may see, for example, the emergence of new classes of people, just as the 19th century created a new massive class of the urban proletariat and much of subsequent political history revolved around the question what to do with this new class of the urban proletariat. Similarly, in the 21st century, we may see the emergence of a new massive class of useless people. People who have absolutely no economic value. It's estimated that within, say, 30 years or so, up to 50% of the jobs in the job market will be taken over by artificial intelligence and computers. Everything from driving taxis to diagnosing diseases, to even teaching, artificial intelligence will be able to do better than humans. There will be, of course, new jobs created, which we don't know of today, but even the new jobs might be performed far better by artificial intelligence than by humans. So we are looking at the possibility of a new massive class of useless humans and of immense, whereas the 20th century was a century of closing gaps, of growing equality in the world, the 21st century may be the most unequal century in human history, in terms of social inequality. Not surprisingly, then, we also see now a new wave of fundamentalism in different places around the world, not only in the Middle East, and it's the same basic reaction. 
the world, the, uh, uh, when you threaten the stability of the world, many people, especially people who are uh, about to lose uh, from, the, uh, from the new situation, try to hold on to something stable and secure. And the first instinct is to go back, to go back to some story which seems to be eternal, which seems to be immutable, immune to all these dangers, to all these changes. But as happened in the 19th century, also in the 21st century, it's very unlikely that the answers to questions, to the new questions, will come from this fundamentalist wave. If we are asking ourselves how to face the threats and opportunities of things like genetic engineering or artificial intelligence, we are not likely to get the answers from the Bible or from the Vedas because the people who wrote the Bible and the Vedas and the Quran and so forth didn't know anything about genetics and didn't know anything about computers. So it's not surprising that the answers are not there. Instead, we'll probably see the emergence of completely new ideologies, completely new religions, completely new stories. Not even socialism and liberalism have the uh, relevant answers. They are ideologies adapted, fit, to the conditions of industrial society, of 19th and 20th century industrial society. They don't have the answers to the new problems of the 21st century. Where will the new religions emerge from? Probably not from the Middle East. If you are looking for the new Muhammad or for the new Lenin, he or she is probably in Silicon Valley and not uh, in the Middle East. This is where the new techno-religions are emerging from. Just as communism promised paradise on Earth with the help of electricity and steam power, so now you see the emergence of new religions, new techno-religions that promise paradise on Earth with the help of genetic engineering and artificial intelligence and computer algorithms and so forth. And they are much more ambitious than anything we've previously seen throughout uh, human history. To give just one example before I wrap, wrap it up and, and leave time for the discussion, for the first time, I mean, even Lenin and Marx, with all their ambitions, never went as far as promising people immortality. Yes, paradise on earth, but eventually, even in the socialist, para in the socialist paradise, you die. And they kept their mouth shut about what's happening to you after you die. Uh, but the new techno-religions that we see emerging from Silicon Valley and, uh, and, and similar places across the world, they even promise immortality here on Earth with the help of technology. For example, Google has established two or three years ago a sub-company called Calico, whose stated mission is to solve the problem of death. Just as we solved all these other technical problems, we are going also to solve this nasty problem of death. Throughout history, people assumed that death was some kind of metaphysical phenomenon, that we die because the gods or the single great creator God decreed that we must die, and there is nothing we can do to change that. Maybe when Jesus comes back to earth, or when the Messiah comes, then we can overcome death, but not before then. Now, more and more scientists are having uh, second thoughts about this defeatist approach. They say we don't need to wait for Jesus Christ to come back to earth in order to overcome death. A couple of geeks in the laboratory can do it. If you just give them enough money and then enough time, they can do it. Death is not a metaphysical phenomenon. Death is simply a technical problem. Why do people die? They don't die because the angel of death suddenly appears and taps them on the, on the shoulder and tells them, come with me, like in an Ingmar Bergman movie. No, people always die because of some technical problem, like the heart stops pumping blood, or cancer is spreading in, 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 in your liver or something like that. And science says that every technical problem has a technical solution. Maybe we don't know the solution yet, but given enough time and money and energy, we can find this solution. 
true or false, I, I won't go into this here, but certainly the new stories, that the most amazing and fascinating stories, which might serve as the basis for a new systems of cooperation in the 21st century world, we are beginning to see them emerging from places like Silicon Valley. Um, I would end then on this, on this tension, on the note of this tension between technology and storytelling and emphasizing that good technology is never enough. Humans don't dominate the planet because they, just because they know how to produce very sophisticated technology. If they don't match this technology with good stories, the result is chaos, the result can be a complete destruction. Technology is neutral, it can, uh, I mean, technology is never really neutral, it changes the world, but whether it changes it for good or evil really depends on the stories that people believe and the stories that people use in order to organize themselves. Um, I think it's, we can say without any doubt that in the 21st century, we will see amazing new technology, better than anything, much more powerful than anything we've seen previously in history. The really big and interesting question is whether we'll be able